Uh, my name is Dustin. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I want to welcome you to service. Uh, if you look on the end of your row, there is a red friendship folder. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that and filling it out and then passing it along down the row um, as people come in, they can fill that out too. Um, yeah, well, welcome to service. I have a couple of announcements I'd love to go through as we're getting started. One of them is on the lake baptism. Uh, the lake baptism is coming up. It is August 28th. Uh, if you've been to the lake baptism before, you know it's a great time of fellowship as we see be people um, taking that step in faith to be baptized. The, the Martins, uh, Kurt and Paula, have offered to uh, do the salmon again as the main dish. We'll do a meal before the baptism. Um, and so if you would like to, yes, we in the front. Um, if you'd like to uh, help with the baptism, one thing that we really could use is um, people to sign up to bring side dishes and desserts. And that sign up is out in the gathering space. So if you're planning on coming and wouldn't mind bringing a side dish or dessert, that'd be great. Salmon will be the main course, and then we'll have hot dogs as well uh, for those who don't prefer salmon. Um, and then whatever else our church family provides, and they always provide more than enough, which is great. So if you wouldn't mind signing up, though, so we have an idea of how many people are bringing what kind of uh, dishes, that would be awesome. And then also, um, baptism with that, if you would like to be baptized, or know someone in your immediate family, maybe, or, or someone in our church family that might want to be baptized, um, just encourage them to touch base with one of our ministry staff, and we would love to talk with you about what that next step of faith looks like um, as uh, we move towards the actual lake baptism on the 28th. Um, and so yeah, we'd love for, for you to be part of that. There also is a map on how to get to where we're going for the Lake Baptism out in the gathering space. It's the same location we've done for the past few years. Um, so if you've been before, you'll recognize that. But uh, for those who don't know, uh, it's out in the gathering space as well. Next is uh, for Heroes for Life. They are still needing volunteers for Heroes for Life. And we would love for you to consider if, if this is an opportunity for you to share Jesus with children in our community. Uh, HFL is seeking some positions that are listed in the bulletin insert. Please fill out that insert and turn it into Karen or in the box um, at the information center in the gathering space. So if you would prayerfully consider whether or not God is calling you to serve in, in this ministry for this year, uh, it, it was amazing last year just to see how God used HFL in the lives of the children in our community. Community, um, and the children in our church. And so if that's something that God is calling you to partner with, uh, contact Karen or fill out um, the, your bulletin insert. And then also HFL, registration is now open. You can register your children um, in kindergarten through fifth grade for HFL. Uh, go to our website, northoak.net, and click on the HFL link. And also tell your friends, whoever else might be um, interested in being part of HFL, have them register as well. And then lastly, Grief Share. Grief Share is still looking for some uh, team members to be part of their leadership team to put on Grief Share. So if you are, are interested in being part of that, if you have experience of, of dealing with loss um, and, and God has, has um, used that experience in your life to, to shape you, he has, he has healed you from that experience, and you would like to provide that type of care for another person who's also going through grief, this would be a great opportunity for you. Uh, so there's information on the bulletin, I think, in your bulletin as well, if that's something that you uh, would be willing to serve in. So that's all the announcements I have for you. Now I encourage you to stand and greet those around you. Good morning. Welcome. I invite you to remain standing as we worship together this morning. Oh 
Father in heaven, we come before you, our great and glorious King. This, this world, Lord, gives you no weight to you, but we draw near to you in worship. We magnify and glorify your name. All power and authority belongs to you, and we thank you that you have chosen to establish a kingdom in perfect justice and in love and mercy. Lord, you chose to bring all who believe into your kingdom, and we are so grateful and thankful, and we gladly embrace you as our Lord and King. Father, we pray that your reign may be seen more clearly in our lives. Forgive us for the complacency with which we have given room to sins in our lives and that have no place in your kingdom. May the truth of your word sanctify us today. We pray for the spread of the gospel in our world, Lord. There are people we love who today are outside of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, bring them in. Cause them to be born again. Deliver them from the kingdom of darkness. Bring them into the kingdom of your dear son, Jesus Christ. And light in our hearts a passion for the spread of the gospel in this generation. We pray for the day when Christ will return. We long to see your son, our King Jesus, hasten the day when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, and he shall reign forever. Come, defeat the enemies who are arrayed against you. Come and judge the world in righteousness, and come and bring us safely into your presence to live under the blessing of your rule. Father, let your kingdom come down, and let your glory reign through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here. Oh. 
Psalm 143.10 Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Holy Spirit, I invite you to remain standing with me as we read from the scripture this morning. We're going to be in the book of Romans, if you have your Bible with you. Uh, specifically, we'll be in chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Will you pray with me? Father God, we love you and we recognize that you are sovereign and that you are good. Thank you for the promises that we have in your word and for the blood of Christ that covers over our sins. We praise you, Lord God, for the volunteers that have signed up for the team to help welcome the Pari family, and we also praise you for the cooler weather and the rain. We pray corporately this morning for our military personnel and their families. Specifically, we pray for Andrew Prine at Fort Campbell, for Mark Rosenboom and his family in Japan, for Lee Freeman on the USS Harry S. Truman, and for Sean Sion in Poland. We pray for your protection over them and that you would give them your peace as they serve our country. We pray, Father, for Chad Meyer and his family as he recovers from his broken fibula, that his recovery will be quick and complete. We pray for the students in our congregation as they prepare to go back to school in the next few weeks. And we pray for the work to be done this year through HFL and that you will provide volunteers for that ministry. Father, we pray for the associate pastor search, that you would raise up an individual to serve in that role. And we pray for our missionaries, both locally and abroad, for Brandon Nims and the Unite Ministry, for Robert and Marlene as they work in Mongolia, and for James Epp and the Crossroads Bible Fellowship. 
We pray this morning that you would bless the Gillette family and the North Oak leadership team with wisdom to lead and that you would give Pastor Josh words to speak this morning as he shared with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. So what I want to do this morning is we'll make, we'll make at least the beginning a little, little interactive because I want to ask you what your favorite Bible verse is. And so if, if you're going to answer the question, you, you actually have to tell me what it is. You don't have to quote it. You, if you want to just paraphrase it, you can do that. If you know it by memory, feel free to give it to us. But for just two or three or four of us, what is your favorite Bible passage? Anybody want to be brave enough and shout that out to the crowd? What, over here, somebody said something? John 3.16, it's hard to beat John 3.16, right? So, for God so loved the world. Someone over here had mentioned one as well. All right, give me that one. All right. So, uh, there's a sports star, a basketball star, that took that verse and put it on a shoe. He didn't put the whole thing on the shoe, if you know that thing. He just put, I can do all things, and he left out everything else. Uh, and uh, so, I, I assume he actually is a Christian from what I've been told uh, and I don't know if it, he dropped it off or the shoemaking company dropped it off, but they kind of altered the meaning of that passage, which is an incredibly important verse, rooting us back to Jesus. So, uh, anybody else? Maybe another one. Yes, sir. I knit you together in my mother's womb. Talk about a verse that kind of captures the heart of our uniqueness, the sacredness of being a human being made in the image of God. But of course, any verse that, that hints to or alludes to or talks about us being made in the image of God certainly uh, talks about our uniqueness and sacredness, but only because of God's much uh, better uniqueness and much greater sacredness, uh, rooting all that theology of who God is and who we are. Uh, all in a verse like that. Just these single sentences in the Bible, uh, maybe a paragraph or maybe an entire chapter or a sermon, because uh, Jesus preached sermons in the New Testament, maybe an entire book of the Bible, or maybe it's a theme. We all kind of get gravitated towards certain themes and ideas, uh, things that come up over and over and over again uh, in the Bible. So I grew up in an independent fundamentalist Baptist background, and I praise God for that background. Uh, maybe a little stiffer than what is maybe biblically necessary, but nonetheless, they really valued the gospel. They valued the Bible as God's inerrant, trustworthy, authoritative word, and those things were impressed on me since I was a little boy. But one of the themes that uh, that background certainly brought forward was uh, these, these things that we need to do. We need to be righteous, and we need to be holy, and we need to live lives that are separate from the world around us. And there's all kinds of Bible verses that talk about us being separate, come out from among them, that call us to be holy, to call us to be righteous. And then you get the social justice warriors who are gravitate towards all the justice passages in the Bible. And there's more than those, of those than you can shake a stick at. Old Testament and New Testament. It's just justice left and right. And then, of course, all kinds of different groups gravitate towards the love of God or the forgiveness of God. There's denominations and pastors and individual Christians that gravitate towards, of all things, hell passages. I mean, they're really excited about hell and warning people about hell and being fearful of hell and the reality of hell. And then, of course, there's others that just gravitate towards the heaven passages, this new heaven, this new earth, and us being together with God forever and ever and ever. All of these themes and so many more we find in Scripture, and we naturally gravitate towards an individual verse, set of verses, theme, section of the Bible, and often for very good reasons, because that theme captured us or captivated us, that Bible passage just, just sort of jumped out uh, at us and sort of consumed our heart and our mind, and it was like a light bulb goes off in our head, and a transformation took place because of this magnificent statement, verse, theme, section of the Bible, uh, and that's good, and that's wonderful, and that's appropriate, but there's a danger that comes with that as well when we allow one idea or one theme or one concept in the Bible to so grab our minds that we shut out or minimize everything else that is contained in God's Word. 
And so what I want to share with you this morning a little bit, taking you back 2,000 years in history in the setting of Jesus' day. I'm not even sure this clicker is working. Here we go. Uh, and let me get to our passage. I want to take you to Daniel. The reason I'm bringing you to Daniel is if there was a popular verse, a favorite verse, or a favorite, uh, more accurately, section of Scripture, uh, there was no more favorite section of Scripture in first century Judaism than the book of Daniel. Daniel loomed large. If you know the setting of Daniel, Daniel sometimes referred to as the revelation of the Old Testament. It kind of starts out as a narrative. It walks through uh, the life of Daniel. There's a whole kind, bunch of things that are happening there. Some of our favorite children's stories come out of Daniel uh, because of this, this bold individual who stood up for his faith. If you remember the setting of Daniel, he was taken captive from Jerusalem, uh, carted off into captivity to a foreign land. But even in the midst of all of that paganism all around him, he stood firm in righteousness and in holiness and in dedication to his God and wouldn't bow the knee to false gods. And that cost him. It cost him quite dearly, in fact, but still stayed faithful and true. That's like the first section of Daniel. And then the second section of Daniel gets into really what is prophecy of things to come. And it gives these big climatic battle sort of imagery of these forces that work against God, and then God coming as this figure who steps in, or, or more specifically, this future prince, this future king, who's going to step into human history as God and on behalf of God to do battle against the forces of darkness, and then God will ultimately prevail. Here's some of the language. It says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days, this uh, metaphorical or this descriptor, this illustration, this title for who God is, uh, took his seat. His clothing was as white. Uh, sorry, I hit that button. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Here it's this image of this coming ancient of days, this ancient, wise, powerful figure who served by tens of thousands of individuals, literally has humanity at his command and at his fingertips as this powerful end times figure who's coming to judge the wicked and to protect the righteous. And then it says this a few verses later. In my vision that night I looked... And there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And so the reason... This uh, book, this particular chapter, by the way, but also some other chapters in Daniel that have similar themes, the reason this became so popular, so huge, captured the imagination and the heart of the first century Jewish people is, of course, because they had endured over 400 years of captivity to foreign lands, foreign leaders. There was a lot of things happening politically and culturally and socially. It was topsy-turvy, and it had been that way for literally centuries. It was a subjugated people, an oppressed people, a hurting and a powerless people, but nevertheless a people who clung to the Old Testament promises. They remembered that there was a covenant that their people had via Abraham with the sovereign Lord, that out of Abraham would come a mighty nation, and they would live in a land that God had for them, and he would be their God, and they would be their people. They remembered they had a covenant through David with the sovereign Lord that a, a, a child, a descendant of David, would always sit upon the throne forever and ever, and it would never end. And yet now they found themselves... A scattered people, there's a word for that, the diaspora, where they literally were pushed out all over the known Roman Empire and beyond. Not even all the Jews lived in the promised land. They didn't even control the, their land that they even lived in, even the houses they lived in. And where was this 
promised, eternal, everlasting descendant of David sitting upon the throne. They had a pretender in Herod who tried to use some of those themes, but he was just simply that, a pretender. And even worse, he was being pulled, his strings were being pulled by the emperor who lived in Rome. And so when they went back to Scripture, of course, a lot of themes, love and grace and law and obedience and the sovereignty of God and the kindness of God and the God is our father and we are his children. God is our judge. God is our king. All of these different ideas and concepts in the Old Testament. But the one that grabbed their heart and mind was this idea of this victorious, powerful, divine entity who is going to come and beat up all the bad guys and establish them as the righteous individuals, and they're going to be put back on top again. In science, or specifically in the science of light, there's this uh, thing referred to as the Raleigh effect or the Raleigh scattering. And so when you look up in the sky in the middle of the daytime, we, of course, usually see a sun. And the sun from our perspective, is often yellow, but that actually technically isn't true. The sun is pure white. Now, the reason it looks yellow is because of how light bounces off of our atmosphere, and so as a white light, by definition, it means it has all of the color spectrums inside of it equally. So it's broadcasting all color spectrums at once to equal degrees down to planet Earth. And then, of course, light, uh, the various light uh, the types that we have or the various colors that we have are different wavelengths. The longer wavelengths are usually the reds. The shorter wavelengths are like the violets and the blues. And so what happens is light as it comes from the sun and it comes into our atmosphere, particularly at noon, uh, and it comes directly down to us, that light interacts with particles that are in our atmosphere already. And there's particles that are roughly the same size in terms of the wavelength of like the blue light. So the blue light hits those particles and scatters across the sky, and the other types of light are able to kind of come through, come down, then we can see and look and observe the things around us. And we look up, and what we see is the blue light of the sun being scattered, the Raleigh scattering, all across the sky. Which, by the way, is why in early morning hours at sunrise, and then, of course, at sunset, often the sky has this sort of red hue to it, because somewhere on planet Earth, the sun is beating down straight on them, and they're looking up at a blue sky. But of course, we're sort of kitty corner from where the sun is, and it has to travel through the atmosphere at a longer distance. And so those longer wavelengths, the reds, now finally reach us and then are scattered. And we look up and we see a red sky, and somewhere it's noon on Earth, and they look up and they see a blue sky. And so I bring that up to say this. So you have all of this light coming through, all of the colors of light coming through with an equal degree of intensity, but that light interacts with various things taking place in our atmosphere, and to us, all we see is blue. And so we look up and we say, the sky is blue. Well, the sky isn't technically blue, but that's how we see it and perceive it. That's the one color that sort of seizes our minds and seizes our hearts, and that's all that we can possibly see. And we do something kind of similar with Scripture. Uh, there's an intentionality to it. We don't always know that we're doing this, but we often are doing it that Scripture is interacting with things taking place in our life, so much so that one idea of Scripture sort of takes over everything else, and God stands as the sun who shines his truth brightly with full intensity, and he wants us to see all of it, perceive all of it, grab a hold of all of it, and bring it into our hearts and our minds. And so the first century world, the idea of God coming to be the conqueror, coming to be the judge, 
of all the world, living and dead, righteous and unrighteous. The one who's the warrior come to, to beat up the bad guy and reestablish his kingdom. The one who's going to rout the Romans out of the Holy Land, maybe even off planet Earth entirely. The one who's going to let everybody know that the Jews were better than everybody else or their particular subset of Jews was better than the other Jews that didn't follow after them. The Qumran community, for example, was one little sect within Judaism that thought all of the other Jewish sects were horrible and immoral and they and they alone were the true righteous children of God and they went to these Bible passages to prove their own self-worth uh, and kindness and love and mercy and grace and a whole bunch of other concepts were set off to the side. And when it came to the idea of who the Messiah was going to be, they did the same thing. Certain truths just sort of bounced off. Other truths were allowed to come through. And what we find in the New Testament with Jesus is that Jesus grabbed a hold of all of these things. In fact, the Daniel passage that we just read, he quoted a section of that when he was before uh, the Sanhedrin in a trial for his life when he was later determined uh, uh, and, and sentenced to be executed, he quoted one of these passages from Daniel. So Jesus embraced all of these things. He saw himself as the coming victorious ancient of days, the son of man who's going to step in and have everlasting dominion and authority and power. He saw himself as the judge of the entire universe, to judge the living and the dead, the righteous and the unrighteous. He saw himself as the son of God who comes in glory glory and in power, in majesty, sovereignty, and truth. He saw himself as all of those things, but he saw himself as more. And that's what I want to get into this morning. Exodus chapter 2, verse 3. We go all the way back to the second book in the Bible. And it gives this image of a Passover lamb. It says this, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Then they are to take the, some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So the context here, of course, Israel is still in a captivity to Egypt. Uh, so you have the slave owners, the overlords, the Egyptians, who have been commanded repeatedly by God through Moses to let the people of Israel go. He consistently refuses to do that. And so now plagues have been sent, multiple plagues, in fact, before we get to this point. And through all of it, the Pharaoh of Egypt is just doubling down on his anger, on his hate, on his intention to be a slave owner over the Jewish people. And we finally get to this uh, plague, this mighty act of God, where God steps in and says, I'm going to send an angel of death. This angel of death is going to go door to door, house to house, room to room. The firstborn of every house, every single house that he enters into, the firstborn is going to be struck dead. Only those homes that have the blood of this lamb that you slaughter. So go out on this night, because in a few hours this is happening, find a lamb, slaughter the lamb, put its blood on the door frame of your house, and as that angel kind of goes through, when he sees the blood on the door frame of that particular house, that angel of death passes by, but anyone who refuses because they do not have the faith to believe and submit themselves to the will of God, and they refuse to put the blood on their doorpost, the angel will enter into that room, and destruction is going to come upon that particular family. Family. We often think of it in terms of the angel of death went to Egyptian homes, but he did not go to Israelite homes, and technically that is not true. 
uh, although that's probably practically how it worked out. Technically, it was he went into any home without the blood, and he did not go into the homes of those with the blood. So if you're an Egyptian, and you put your faith and trust in God, and you put blood in your doorframe, you're protected by the blood of the lamb. And if you're an Israelite who says, I don't believe in this superstitious nonsense, and you didn't put the blood on the doorframe of your home, the angel would enter into your home. There's the sort of key idea that's there, this blood, this Passover lamb, which protects against this coming wrath and judgment. But that Passover lamb can only protect when that lamb is slaughtered and his blood is applied. Now what I find fascinating is Jesus himself and the New Testament authors not only went back to this section of scripture to root the ministry of Jesus, but they did so not on the theme of Jesus is the righteous judge who's come to exercise judgment on a lost and dying world, although quite literally that's what Jesus does. But instead, they went to a different idea, a different concept rooted in the same basic story. Paul actually just simply refers to Jesus as our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians. And so one of the ministries of Jesus was to see himself as this Passover lamb who slaughtered on behalf of his people because his people deserve, they deserve judgment. But God in his grace and his mercy and his love doesn't want to judge you for the sins that you've committed. He wants to protect you and love you and forgive you and scoop you up into his arms. We've had times with our, with our children, all three of our children, but particularly our boys, where the teenage years were rough. Teenage years were just not fun years. You know, if you could go from toddler years and skip right over that to grandkids, that would be an awesome way of going about it. But that's not how it works, right? So we all kind of have to endure these teenage years. And I get it. I was a jerk of a teenager. Uh, and my boys were so much better than I was when I was when, when their age in high school. But nonetheless, a lot of hard conversations. Or I do remember probably the most heartbreaking moment for me as a parent is my daughter. When she was a little girl, she's probably seven, eight years old. No idea where she heard this, where she picked it up, but she was mad about something, and she looked at me with her little angry eyes, with angry tears coming down her face because she didn't get what she wanted, and for the first time out of her mouth were the words, I hate you. So we, we did what we needed to do. We, we exercised punishment the way we needed to at that moment, and I went into my room, and I cried. I just bawled, right, because my little precious baby girl said that she hated me. And a little bit later on, uh, we come out, and she felt bad about what she did, and she was reading her Bible, and she came out, and she, in tears, this time not angry tears, but repentant tears, Daddy, I'm so sorry, gave me a big hug. This instinct kicked in. I just scooped her into my arms and loved her and forgave her and wanted to protect her and cherish her because that's what fathers do. That's what moms do. That's what parents do. We want to love and protect and cherish our children, but we can't make decisions for them. They've got to want to be in the relationship the way we want to be in the relationship. And we can set the stage, and we can guide, and we can encourage, and we can remind them that forgiveness and restoration and relationship is possible, but that's really the extent of all that we can do at that moment in time. And God, as our Father in heaven, sees the rebellion and sees the sin and feels the impact of our rejection against him nevertheless is still the loving father who seeks to simply protect and forgive his children. And that's the whole issue with this blood of the lamb. It truly has dimensions of wrath and sovereignty and holiness and the justness of who God is. All of that is built into that image, but also built into the image is a God who just wants to protect his sons and his daughters and love and forgive. And that protection comes through Jesus Christ slaughtering himself, being slaughtered in order to be that protection, that blood on the door frames of our life so that this wrath of God is something that you and I will never experience if we put our faith and trust in him. Do you get that? God who is holy and just, full of sovereign, authoritative, 
perfectly moral wrath and judgment, you will never experience or meet that God. You will meet the God who is loving and grace-filled and kind and protective. Why? Because wrath has nothing to do with you as a believer in Jesus Christ because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. You're covered by Jesus. You get Abba, Father. You don't receive wrathful judge. God is judge. God has wrath, but none of that is applied to you because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb if you put your faith and trust in Jesus. There's another image that we find in the Old Testament, this time coming from Leviticus. Leviticus 16, uh, I still want to preach a sermon series so badly on Leviticus. I have been studying Leviticus for 16 years, trying to figure out how to bring this to God's people in a, in a, in a pretty in-depth sermon series. Uh, and Leviticus gets into the weeds really quickly. So you just open it up. In the very first chapter in Leviticus, you're talking about not only slaughtering animals, but how you slaughter animals, like how you rip out their entrails. Kind of a rough subject to bring to people on a Sunday morning. So Leviticus is deep. It gets into the weeds really fast. But it's absolutely important and, uh, and key for our understanding of Scripture as a whole. But then we get to chapter 16, and it introduces this crazy, far-out concept of two goats. It says this, then he, the, the priest, is to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is the precursor to the temple. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat goat. You've heard that expression, a scapegoat. We use that term all the time uh, in our modern day uh, lingo. You're making me a scapegoat. I'm not going to be your scapegoat. We, we use that language constantly. This is where we get that language from. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. Now skip ahead a little bit later on in this chapter. But the goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. A little bit later in the chapter it says this, When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it, all of the wickedness and the rebellion of the Israelites, all of their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness and take care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all of their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it to the wilderness." Now you think, what in the world kind of kooky stuff is happening in Leviticus chapter 16? Did they really think? Were these people so backwards, so illiterate, so pre-scientific, they thought, hey, two goats, we got a sin problem in our community. I think two goats is going to fix it. So we're going to bring in two goats, and then this one, we're going to eat this one because we're hungry. And this one, we're going to pretend like we're going to take all of our sin, and we're going to put it on that goat, and that goat's the bad guy. We're not the bad guy ergo problem solved. I think they were a little more sophisticated than that. They understood what was taking place was an illustration or a metaphor of sorts. It was their way of reminding themselves we have a sin problem that's bigger than us. And the only entity in the entire universe that can cure this sin problem is the living God. So we're going to bring one goat in and we're going to have a sacrifice to honor and to worship and to revere this holy, wrathful, but also loving creator of the entire universe. And we're going to have this other goat, and we're going to put all of our sins on this, and we're going to release it to the Lord into the wilderness and just let it go. And, and, and out there in a place that we can't reach, out there in a place that's dangerous for us, as if to say this, we can't solve this issue and so we're putting all of this sin in one place, and we're sending it off to you, God, to deal with. It's bigger than us. It's stronger than us. It controls us. It's overwhelmed us. It defines us. 
And God, I wish we could take our sin and rip it out of my chest and put it on something else and solve the problem, but that's not the way it works. And so we're going to pretend we're going to have this service and just, just lay this before you and say, it's you who have to fix this. A similar thing takes place in the New Testament for a very different reason, not a sin issue, but a sickness issue. When it says to anoint people with oil, uh, it was their way of saying, hey, we, we set this person apart who has a disease or an illness or a sickness of some kind that our medicine and our medical knowledge can't touch, can't cure, can't overcome. And we recognize that God and God alone is powerful and sovereign. So we lay hands on this individual and we anoint this individual with oil to make a public declaration that this is bigger than us. And only God can fix this. And this person is in the hands of God to be cured or to be called to home to be with him forever, whatever the case might be. But this person is God's. The same issue taking place with the scapegoat. All the sins placed on this goat metaphorically released into the wilderness as a prayer, as a call, as a plea. God, please fix this on our behalf. That scapegoat language is used for language of blame, but originally it was used for language of absorption. I'm bringing on, I'm taking on, I'm carrying all that's wrong and wicked with the nation of Israel, all that's wrong and wicked with anyone who wants to follow after God. And then we see Jesus stepping in to this equation as the one who takes upon himself the sins of the entire world, becomes a scapegoat, not simply for Moses and Aaron, not only only for the people of Israel, not only for, he's a scapegoat for the sins of the entire world. Because he is alone, the one who can actually go out into the wilderness and deal with it, and fix it, carry it, and do something about it. This image in the Old Testament of Jesus as the Passover lamb who slaughtered to protect us. Jesus, the coming Messiah, who is the scapegoat upon whom we put all of our sins and being who we are, kick him as he goes his way out of town into the wilderness. Jesus as Passover lamb, Jesus as scapegoat. But there's another image I want to call to your attention. This comes from Isaiah, the second most quoted book in the New Testament. This is a passage that we often refer to as the passage of the suffering servant. It's the servant of God. It uses that language, the servant of the Lord, who is going to be sent by God to bring in an era of justice and peace and restoration and salvation and mercy and establish the kingdom of God. And there's multiple servant songs in Isaiah, and this is just one of them. But it says this. This is different than all of the other ones. Isaiah chapter 42, for example, the servant is going to bring justice to the nations. He's going to rout the foreigners who bring about injustice and wickedness and iniquity and evil. And instead, he's going to be a light to the Gentiles and a light to the nations. He's going to stand for truth and justice and integrity and power. But this song is different. Same servant. Now it tells us how he's going to bring about truth and how he's going to bring about peace and how he's going to bring about justice. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity or the sin of us all. You have Passover lamb themes here. You have scapegoat themes here. You have this servant image who's despised and rejected, mutilated, humiliated, tortured, killed and slaughtered, and all because the sins of all of us are laid upon him. And in the first century Jewish world, there were some who gravitated towards this message. 
They saw the situation they were in, controlled and oppressed and abused by the Romans, controlled and oppressed and abused by the turncoat Jewish individuals who were their tax overlords, the tax collectors, for example. They experienced that brutality, and in their heart they longed, they longed for a victorious warrior who would beat up the bad guy and restore everything back to the way it was supposed to be. But in God's grace, they could see even deeper into their own hearts and their own souls. The problem wasn't just with Egypt. It's not just with Pharaoh. It's not just with the emperor of Rome. It's not just with the Jewish tax collectors. The problem isn't only the evil and the debauchery of King Herod. If I'm going to be really honest with myself as this first century Jew, I am one of my biggest problems in my life. I am my greatest enemy. I am the villain of my own story. And I need a God who's going to come and not just fix Herod and the emperor of Rome and the brutal, cruel, immoral tax collectors. God needs to fix me too. It's my sin which is my problem. Pharaoh's sin is his problem. Herod's sin is his problem. My sin is my problem problem, and I need a righteous, victorious warrior king who's going to fix this problem as well. But how does that even happen? Because this mighty warrior, victorious prince, kingly judge, son of man, ancient of days, he comes swinging a sword, and that's part of who my God is. But then Jesus stepped into human history 2,000 years ago and said, yes, part of it is bringing this sword of wrath and judgment. But the best part for you, for you is a king and a Messiah who's willing to die for you, to be despised for you, to be rejected because of you, to take every wicked thought, every pornography website, every angry word that you said against your spouse, every impatient action, every theft that you've committed, everything that you have ever done wrong and will do wrong in your entire life, and he takes it upon the broadness of his shoulders. And I would say he takes it because he can take it. He couldn't take it. It killed him. It slaughtered him. It broke him. But he did it because he loves you. He wants to be the Passover lamb. He is the Passover lamb. He wants to be the scapegoat. He is your scapegoat. He is your suffering servant who came to give you new life. And so when you turn to the pages of the Bible, I do want you to see Jesus as his righteous warrior coming prince and judge who makes all things new. But more importantly, I want you to see how he does that. He does that as your Passover lamb as your scapegoat and your suffering servant. Dear Heavenly Father, you are good and gracious, wonderful and true. May your word dwell dwell richly in us as we see Jesus, who is our Passover lamb. He is our scapegoat, and he is this mighty and powerful king who nevertheless decided to also be a servant who's despised and rejected by men. Because of him, through him, we find salvation. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us.
sadness, give him all your years of pain, and you'll enter into life in Jesus' name. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lives. and keep you and his face shine upon you as you journey through this week and we come together again. Amen. Amen.